Thank you. Uh, cool. So uh, I talked about given two relationships between stress and strain. So we can define stress uh, using that Voigt notation as a, as a single vector, a six by one vector, and relate it to strain using a stiffness tensor and strain to stress using a compliance tensor, which are the inverse of each other. Here C is just S inverse or vice versa. That uh, compliance tensor or that stiffness tensor, what do I want to write out first? Compliance tensor is probably a little bit easier. Uh, compliance tensor which again, S for compliance and C for stiffness, uh, for an isotropic material was one over E, then a whole big thing. Let me look at it to make sure I'm not writing constants down wrong. Uh, one minus nu minus nu, one, one minus nu, two times one plus nu, two times one plus nu, Plus new, then a whole bunch of zeros everywhere. Uh, don't need one there. Whole bunch of zeros, and then this is symmetric on the other side, so I'm not going to write it out. The compliance tensor we can write out either using uh, uh, Lemay constant in bulk modulus or using Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio with. Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. This is that E over 1 <coughs> plus nu, 1 minus 2 nu, which is a slightly longer version. 1 minus nu, 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 1 minus nu, nu, 1 minus nu, 1 minus 2 nu over 2, 2 nu over 2, 1 minus 2 nu over 2. This big Pumpkin thing, zeros, zeros, zeros. Cool. And so I had written out these two constants. We went through a couple simple examples where we showed for uniaxial tension, we got what we would expect the, the strain. Uh, it stretches based on the Young's modulus in one direction, and then it contracts based on the Poisson's ratio in the other two. Uh, we showed an example of uh, uniaxial strain and showed that that was that you have basically to get a uniaxial strain you have to apply a corresponding stress to prevent the material from uh, going in then I had asked what the why some of these terms were zero oh, and now it's going to disappear uh, in a pole everywhere and now I'm going to ask the other question in that pole everywhere which was if we have biaxial stress. Oh. oh, you guys already answered it from last time. Cool. So I'm going to give you another like 30 seconds to look through this, or some people already answered it from last time. So if I take now a material and I stress it biaxially, so I have a piece of paper and I'm pulling it this way and this way with equal stress, what then is the strain, the corresponding strain, and how would you find that? You might need to do some calculations to figure it out. Take 30 seconds and talk to your partner about it while I actually draw this thing out.
because it's um, you're talking about strain in, in the transverse direction, not in the axial direction. It's uh, Poisson ratio is a constant you use, so maybe Poisson ratio times the stress um, over the end modulus, and you have to be twice using the other directions. Yeah. And so it would be negative two Poisson ratio sigma over. Oh. Yeah, two axes. So if you have a, uh, let's say you have a block like this, and you have tension coming out of this side, okay. tension coming out of this side, Let's how does it strain? Do you need more time? Okay, keep talking to your partners. So, it's two um, actual tension tests, so we can kind of take it at the sum of both of them, is what I'm guessing. So, yeah, Okay, things are quieting down. Do you still want more time, or is that good? Okay. So, now we have a uh, biaxial stress, so stress in the X and the Y, and we're trying to figure out what the strain in the Z direction is, if that's unconfined. So our stress, we can write out to something like that, where there's X, Y, and then nothing for the rest of them, and I want to figure out what my strain is. So to figure that out, I could plug my stress into here, effectively, um, multiply out a stress sigma sigma zero 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 uh, and I could pl plug that in and figure out what my strain now in my z direction would be which if I did that I would get there's a, uh, a negative new a negative <laughs> new and all the whole bunch of uh, dang it I was gonna and zeros just because I might as well write them out uh, if I plug that in, then I would get sigma minus nu, sigma minus nu. So my strain now, um, I guess, in the z direction, that which is that third row there, is negative two sigma. Yes. Over e. Over e. Ha. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. There's an e up front that carries through. Um, yeah. So intuitively we can think about this as if I take a uniaxial material and I pull it it contracts with Poisson's ratio nu, nu, minus nu over e in the x and the y direction but then if I'm pulling it in both directions it's both of those strains or both of those stresses are causing it to contract so then it's effectively contracting twice as much and if these were different it would be sigma 1 plus sigma 2 if, if I was applying non-uniform biaxial stress Cool. And so these these are a very convenient way to calculate out then stress and strain from all of this. In practice, you're not going to be using these too much, but where you will see it uh, is in finite element modeling. So pull up. Maybe. <coughs> Come on. There we go. Cool. <laughs> so uh, there's a whole bunch of different finite element solvers out there. This one is called Abacus. It's one that I uh, happen to have used a lot. So in Abacus, I made this W. I applied a force to the top, a fixed displacement on the bottom. Uh, in there, I meshed this up with a pretty coarse mesh, switch context. So the idea of finite element is when you have a complicated geometry like this, it's really hard to, so, so all, these, all these things we're doing are calculating for a block, a simple block or a cylinder or a simple uniform shape. But then when you have a sort of complex shape that, you, that isn't necessarily uniform, the stresses in here also aren't uniform. So what you do is you break this complicated body up into teeny tiny either uh, cubes or I guess rectangle, uh, rectangular cube, uh, there's a, I can't even remember, or tetrahedra. Um, and then you solve the stresses on those smaller elements, you interpolate it over the whole body and you get a stress out. And so if I were to submit this, I'm only gonna apply a small strain to this. Uh, and this, I'm gonna have 
Oh, I don't even know. I might, might have actually I solved it before. But this is a, a simple uniaxial linear elastic calculation. It takes like two seconds to solve. Um, when you go to a large deformation, then the solving gets more complicated. But what you end up with is something like this, where now in our undeformed and our deformed state, uh, let's amplify this a little bit. So now I'm going to make that displacement a lot bigger. Uh, is that like 5,000? There we go. Cool. So I'm, I'm pushing down on the tops here and the bottoms here are fixed. And what I can look at now is in my stress, I have those different stress components, S11, 22, 3, 3, 4, 4, or 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3. And so these are my uniaxial stresses in each direction uh, and my corresponding shear stresses in each direction. And the way that it's calculating that, there's also my, my corresponding strains in each direction, which should just match basically what the stresses were because it's a linear elastic calculation. The way that it's figuring that out is using this Hooke's Law in 3D relationship. Um, because it's small strain linear elastic, when you get into plasticity, that's what we'll talk about, I think, next week. Uh, and we'll start talking about yield surfaces and plastic strain relationships. But um, now, when you look at a finite element simulation, we'll also talk about what Mises and Tresca stress are. But you'll now see, you'll now understand that you're looking at stresses in different directions in this body. And that it may not necessarily be uniform. And here at a sharp corner, you see a stress concentration. This is a really coarse mesh, so it's not actually the right stress concentration, but the right idea. Um, yeah. Does it auto randomize those sort of element boundaries there? Like on the left, it's pretty much linear, but on the right arm, it's kind of scattered. Uh, oh, yeah. Was that intentional, or is that no, sort of that's, part of the program? That's random. Oh. Uh, mesh, uh, mesh creation is actually one of the more complicated parts of finite element. The algorithms are really complicated. So actually, you'll notice it's this is only in two D. So it's uh, it's symmetric, uh, or it's it's a plane thing that they extrapolated out. Uh, if I wanted to mesh a random three D body, I would have to use tetrahedra because it's too difficult to mesh it with cubes like that. Um, but even then, with cubes on a two D surface, basically they just mesh this W surface, and they kind of sp uh, spit nodes in there randomly based on. An element size. It's a it's a whole thing. I can talk to you more about it later if you're interested. Yeah. Cool. So this is that practical application of the thing that we've been seeing about, and this is the context that you'll most likely run into it. Uh, all right. So let's talk about anisotropic elasticity. Yeah. Fun stuff. So trap. Oh, do I want to talk about that? couple cases. Maybe I'll talk about those later. So there, there are also a couple simplified cases of plane stress and plane strain that I want to talk about. Put them in the notes. So uh, sure, I'll talk about it really quickly. So this 3D relationship works for an arbitrary body, uh, but sometimes as engineers we want to simplify these these relationships because that can be a lot to work with, especially if you're doing it by hand. So there's a couple simplifications that get used pretty commonly called plane stress and plane strain, where if I have a really thin sheet like this, I can assume because of the free boundary on the surface, the stress on this surface in this direction is zero and on this direction is zero. Um, so I can assume that if I have a thin body like this, the stress through the thickness is approximately zero. Uh, so I have a plane stress condition where stress can only exist in the XY plane. Uh, and there's a simplification to this based on that. Conversely, if I have a really thick body, like I'm, if I was in the earth or something, uh, it's, uh, it would be difficult to strain in the thickness direction. And so I could assume the strain in the thickness direction was approximately zero. And there's another simplification based on that. I have that in the notes, uh, and I don't know if I want to talk about it today. Uh, but it's it's in the notes that I posted on Wednesday, uh, and it will be in the notes that I continue to post. But right now, I'd rather talk about anisotropic elasticity because it's useful for your lab. So now we have these two relationships for stiffness and compliance, or compliance and stiffness. I want to generalize this. 
So this is useful for isotropic elastic materials, which not m many things are. We assume that m lots of, particularly metals are, uh, and any polycrystalline grained material. But uh, if, say, I have a carbon fiber composite, it definitely is not a valid assumption. So um, there's the generalized form of these, which I can write out oh, now. Uh, I'm going to write out my compliance tensor. So now I can say uh, I had written out before S11, then I had copied that S12, S11, S11, because these were all the same. Now I don't necessarily want to do that. So I'm going to have this as an S12, S13, S14, S15, S16, S22, S33, 4, 5, 6, S, 2, 3, 2, 4, oh, this is going to be 3, oh, 2, 2, 3, 4, come on, S, 2, uh, S, 2, 5, S, 2, 6, 3, 6, 4, 6, 5, 6, 4, 5, oh, that was, uh, 3, 5, 3, 5, 5, S, 4, 5, and then this is symmetric, so I'm not going to write out that other side for real this time. And so I can write this out for my stiffness tensor and my compliance, or my compliance tensor and my stiffness tensor. And I can say now for an arbitrary body, if I don't know exactly what's going on, any of these could be non-zero. So for our isotropic material, all these were zero, which you remember that means if I push on a body, I don't expect it to shear, or if I shear a body, I don't expect it to contract or expand axially. But that's not always the case. Like I had mentioned, if you have a crystal structure that's uh, not necessarily square, and I had something like that, if I pushed on it, I would actually get some shear outward. So these values may not necessarily be zero. Most of the time that we assume they are, um, but they're not necessarily. Uh, similarly, for an anisotropic material, the stiffness here and the stiffness is here in each the x, y, and z direction may not all be the same. Um, and same for shear relationships. So this is the most general form of that compliance tensor. We're going to look at a couple examples of that, but first I'm going to give you a simplified version that is actually relevant, which is for transversely isotropic materials. So for transversely isotropic materials, transversely isotropic, that means that the properties in one in one direction are different and in two directions are the same. So uh, properties, I have uh, property one in some direction and then I have property two in the other two directions. So this is useful for say a carbon fiber composite where I have um, fibers along this direction fibers. Um, so the in the fiber direction it's stiff, but in, in the orthogonal to the fibers it's the same regardless of which direction I'm looking at as long as I'm, I'm orthogonal to the fibers. This is useful for trees actually. So if you think about a tree, you have wood grains on a tree that are kind of circular um, and those, that, those rings around the tree mean it has one stiffness in one direction and approximately equal properties in the other two directions. This is useful for cold rolled metal, or for rolled metals. So if I had in that, that first day, when I have those, those long metal grains kind of aligned with whatever direction I'm rolling stuff in. Grains. Uh, long metal grains. Cool. So it's anisotropic relative to this direction. I have some properties in this direction and then approximately equal properties in the other two directions. So this transversely isotropic, so it's uh, in, the, in the transverse directions, in the, 
basically the if this is my x in the y and z it's the same so it's isotropic in one plane but it's anisotropic in that third plane so for those types of materials i can write out a much simpler form of my <coughs> compliance tensor <coughs> where now i'm not going to pull out my uh, my stiffness out front but i'm going to have one over E x, where E x is now the stiffness in that one direction, or one over E one, uh, negative new, y x, y x over E y, new z x over E z, well, uh, but these are the same, so I'm going to replace that. Uh, y x over e y 1 over e y new z y or er, uh, new sure z y which is the thing over e y and 1 over e y here then I'm going to have uh, this is also my new, I'm going to switch these up and I'm going to tell you why in a second. E x negative new uh, x z over e x new y z over e y. Uh, this I need to expand a lot. I'm actually still going to have zeros all the way out here. So I'm going to ignore all of those. I'm going to call this a 1 over g y z, 1 over g y z, and 1 over g x y. Also zeros here. So what I basically did is I say these, if, if that new, if this was an isotropic material, these would be the same relationships as I had before. Uh, I had a 1 over E out front, I had a negative new here, I had a 1 over E everywhere. Yeah? Um, for this tensor, what would the coordinate system be that would line up with, like, which one is that anisotropic direction? So this would be, uh, right, I guess I wrote it a little bit weird. Uh, X, if I do Y, Y, Z, something like that. Yeah, so this would be x along the direction of anisotropy. So what I did is I say now my ex and my ey are two different values, and that ey is the same in all those directions. There's one relationship that's useful for Poisson's ratio in anisotropic materials like this, and that is uh, nu xy over e x is equal to new y x over e y. So my Poisson's ratio isn't necessarily the same in all the directions. It does change with these anisotropic materials, which you will see a little bit in the lab um, for because you'll be testing now carbon fiber composites in one direction and in the other direction. <coughs> There's a way to quantify this anisotropy. Uh, so. Let's see. The how do I write this out? Yes. So if I want to quantify anisotropy, quantify anisotropy p, uh, I use something called the Zener ratio. That's kind of small. Uh, make that bigger. Zener ratio. I don't know if that made it any better. Maybe it made it worse. So, the idea behind this now is I think about my stiffness tensor, my C, and I have that C11, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, um, 1, 2, 1, 3, uh, two, three, and then a whole bunch of other stuff in there. There we go. 
and then a whole bunch of other stuff in there. What I want is now to calculate the relative ratios between these and use that to quantify how anisotropic a material is. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define some constant A that's equal to 2C44 over C11 minus C12. And if I were to plug stuff in from my previous compliance tensor, so I have 1 minus 2 nu. So uh, if this was an isotropic material, uh, how do I want to do that? Let's do this. Did this show up? Yeah. Cool. So I would have a 1 minus 2 nu over 2 times 2. This is my C4. Uh, all over E, or I guess times that times that funky constant E out front that I'm going to leave out because it's going to cancel. Um, I have a 1 minus nu for my C11 and then a minus a second nu. So then these 2's would cancel out. I would get 1 minus 2 nu over 1 minus 2 nu, which would just be 1. So for an isotropic material, if that 2C44 over C11 minus C12 is 1, I can say my material is isotropic based on this Zener ratio quantification. There's a, a handful of other ways to do it, but this is a, a simple one that often gets referenced. But for any anisotropic material, this, this may not necessarily be 1. So, for example, uh, there's a nice table of this actually in the Myers and Chala book, but I'm going to write out a couple of these here. So, Example for metals. Uh, if I have a couple different FCC metals and a couple different BCC metals, FCC metals, uh, let's look at copper, copper, uh, gold, and aluminum. That a here is approximately equal to 3.7, uh, 2.7, and 1.2. So that means copper is a very anisotropic material. This is the perfect single crystal of copper. Uh, the perfect single crystal of aluminum is pretty isotropic, maybe less so. But remember, for engineering materials, we very, very rarely have a single crystal. Uh, generally, we have a whole bunch of polycrystals, all kind of stuff around together, and the, this anisotropy will affect how those grains interact, but we kind of ignore it and we say it's isotropic. Mm -hmm. And to actually understand it, you got to go really, really deep into the science of it. But you should at least have this in mind when you're thinking about how materials are deforming. Um, BCC metals now, there's a couple, um, let's look at lithium iron and tungsten and lithium is a very very anisotropic material which is about 9.4 uh, iron is about 2.4 and tungsten is actually pretty close to one like within a margin of error so tungsten kind of randomly is just a very isotropic crystal structure I don't know if there's necessarily a reason why but kind of serendipitously it is Cool. So, I'm going to stop there and give a couple seconds for questions or thoughts or concerns. If you calculate the name of one, does that by definition mean that it's isotropic? Or could it possibly be one and not be isotropic? It could possibly be one and not, is not isotropic, but it's approximately isotropic. So to actually look at it, we would have to, oh, there's, there's a cool way to go about it that, oh, oh damn it. <laughs> uh, there's a cool way to go about it in the book that, uh, that, that it shows in the book where you draw basically, so, so this is only, these values are the stiffness in the x, x, y, and z direction, for example. But you could, if you had just a, a sphere of material, poke on it at any arbitrary angle and figure out what the Young's modulus is. And so if you do that, you could actually draw out an elasticity 
sphere that defines how isotropic something is. And there's a couple schematics in the book that show if, if when you do that, the Young's modulus is exactly the same in every direction, then it's perfectly isotropic and that isotropy map would be a, a sphere, that stiffness map would be a sphere. And if it wasn't, it would be, you could have like a disc or an ellipsoid or something else. And like the shape of that is, is how you would really quantify an isotropy, but it's a lot harder to do. And this is kind of a simple, quick metric for it. That's a little bit easier to do because that way that map you can only really get with a numerical method, which isn't necessarily what the actual material is. So, good question. Other thoughts, concerns? Cool. So, <coughs> do you want to talk about viscoelasticity for a few minutes and then I can go through the lab really quick? <coughs> I know you've recorded some notes. Uh, yeah, I, I do not. Okay, yeah, go for it. So I have to write it out. Just go over the edge. So. Yeah. <coughs> How much time do I have? Mm, like five, ten minutes. Oh, okay, five, ten minutes. Yeah. Sure. And then I'll go through the lab. Um, so in that case, I'll just. Um, I saw I did a printout of the notes that I posted a few days ago. Hope you guys take a look of it. Um, so in short, um, I'll try to summarize what what this note is about. Um, so in viscoelasticity, we're just um, describing the time-dependent material behavior of a material tends to depend on um, several physical factors. Um, one dominant um, factor is temperature, um, especially for polymetric uh, material, even composite. At different temperature, it, it shows a certain degree of like viscoelasticity, and that also um, strain rate is also another factor. Um, the rate you're pulling um, the material, I think Professor Lucas mentioned it a few lectures ago, and how fast you pull the material um, varies the stiffness of the material as well, and that's one um, pr properties of viscoelasticity as well, and humidity and also strain level. Too, which is um, a lot less common, but could be one of the reasons as well. Um, so the applications, in short, um, we study viscoelasticity is to study material that showcase such property. But such material is used a lot in um, one example in, in structural. So <coughs> a lot of high-risk building, which which is located in somewhere that's um, prone to earthquakes. They have this um, what we call um, steel plates coated with viscoelastic polymers. So basically, trusses and then in the middle of the trusses has this uh, a damper that absorbs the shock from um, shearing due to earthquake. And then you also uh, use it for um, safety material like helmets because they're good. Um, the the main reason is because they absorb impact energy really well. Because um, you don't really fully elastic material will store the energy and release the energy. So, in the case of like um, safety, like you try to protect your your, um, your head some some way that's um, crucial for your body, you absorb those energy. And one interesting thing is in biomedical in um, te technology, uh, scientists actually try to um, characterize the um, viscoelastic properties of biological cells and biological tissues. So one really interesting fact is um, cancer cells, um, they, they try to measure the stiffness and viscoelastic property of cancer cells and healthy cells, and they found cancer cells a lot softer than um, healthy cells. So they use this uh, technique called atomic force microscopy, so it's a cantilever that's like really, really small, and over here, and then it, they prop on on the cell, which is on that brown thing over here, and then measure like the um, um, kind of like the stress and curve of it. Yeah, pretty cool. <coughs> yeah, which is also part of beam bending because uh, you have to know the flexural rigidity of the um, atomic force microscope. And most of 
most of the time it's made of um, silicon or alumina, which is a type of silicon as well. Um, so I'll just go straight to um, two ways we can quantify <coughs> um, viscoelasticity. One is what we call stress relaxation. So the idea is if you have a, a material and then you pull it in a step strain, if you guys heard of step function, the term, so you pull it like instantaneously and then at the same time you try to measure the stress. So you measure the stress time and then normally for a viscoelastic material you can see this like curve and it eventually converges to a certain value. For, for an elastic, full elastic material, you will not have this um, like decay over here, you just have a, a straight curve because it's not time dependent. So in this way you can see that the stress and the time actually um, is very sensitive to time. And the, and the thing is, this, uh, there's also something we call as the constitutive relationship for viscoelastic material. So just like elastic models defines, um, characterize um, a, a fully elastic material, but for viscoelasticity, there's also also a way for us to characterize the um, the properties of, of, of viscoelastic material, which is which is why we call as the relaxation models. So basically, if in the lab you apply a step strain on the material and then you measure the stress and time, and then you divide. Uh, the stress measurements by the um, constant strain you apply and you get something what's called the relaxation models. So theoretically <coughs> relaxation models should stay uniform uh, regardless um, epsilon not, regardless the uh, strain level. So this is to be consistent with uh, what we call as uh, standard linear viscoelasticity but it only normally works for small strain or well, like Five percent or less. Like more than that, uh, normally it will start uh, behave um, having a different trend over here. <coughs> and another way we can characterize um, viscoelasticity is something we call a creep behavior. It's just the total opposite of it. So creep behavior is when you apply a step stress. So I think it like. Um, uh, uh, rubber and then you put uh, a dumbbell on top of it and you can try to measure like over time like how much deformation is happening so you get so imagine like you put a dumbbell with this um, stress value or weight and then you s measure the strain and you can see that it's also started conversion to a certain value <laughs> and you do the same thing you divide by the um, constant stress or weight that you apply on the material and you get the creep models and like I said creep models also stays about the same despite a different sigma not you apply and then quickly um, there's uh, several ways or several models that um, most people use to try to model this behavior and one simple one if you guys take it in like system dynamics like spring, spring and dash pot or, or damper is, is, is very commonly used. There's two config, uh, three configurations that um, we like to consider. This is what we call the Maxwell model. So you can see that the spring and the dash pot or the damper is in series. And then you have a Kelvin model here. Um, instead in series, you have in parallel, right? And then finally we have another configuration uh, what we call a standard linear viscoelastic model that you have um, basically one uh, Maxwell model in, in parallel with another spring. So most of the time, um, typically for a lot of viscoelastic material, this model works the best. So um, the math, um, if time permits, where is it? <laughs> Left? Oh. Um, Takes some time to uh, look at the map, but it's the derivations is on the right side, and you don't really need to know the details how. Because if any one of you take on system dynamics, you sort of know how it's derived by using um, these two relationship. So for for a spring, 
it basically stress is linearly proportional to strain <laughs> with E as the uh, slope, the constant slope. And for a, damp for a damper or dash part, you have stress linearly proportional to strain rate, not strain. So, and then eta is just the viscosity, just like water viscosity. What's that? Oh. So, <laughs> this, is, this is my uh, <laughs> elasticity demo. So, most materials don't really follow that perfect creep relationship, yeah. wherever it was. Serious. Um, but for some very, very viscous materials, mm -hmm. like silly putty, you actually have that viscosity changing. So you can pretend the material is just a dash pot. Yeah. So, for example, with this, if I pull a pull silly putty really slowly, it, it stretches stays there. out and it thins out. Um, but if I pull it fast enough, let's see if I can actually pull it fast enough. There we go. It rips like a normal material would, and it doesn't stretch. And that's because it has such a high viscoelasticity that when I pull it, it just kind of keeps deforming unless I pull it really, really fast. So there's certain materials, actually one engineering material in particular, that's really interesting for this, and that's tar. So oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. tar, like the same stuff that they put in the roads, is actually a super, super viscoelastic material. And there's, so if, if I held the silly putty, eventually it would kind of droop down and droop down under gravity. When it's hot, only when it's hot. Tar? Yeah. No, no, it's always, so there's, there's, yeah. an, there's an incredible experiment, mm -hmm. which is one of the longest running scientific experiments uh, somewhere in the UK, and I can't remember the university, or maybe, no, Australia, in mm -hmm. Queen's University, Australia, something called the oh. tar drop experiment, or pitch, pitch drop experiment, where they have a tank of pitch, a, a tar, and they have a small opening at the bottom, and they're watching this tar kind of slowly drip out and wait for it to form a drop and drop down. And so far, in the course of like the 40-something year experiment, they've seen 11 drops of tar. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's one of the longest running science experiments, like continuously running. And they just, they, I think they have it on YouTube, and they have a video of it going. Just, just yeah, like a live stream. It's not, it's not the most exciting live stream. Uh, yeah. Cool. Oh. 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 Lab really quick. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, so All yeah. the lab. Yeah. Uh, lab actually. The attention lab. Oh, so, you should do it. <laughs> so, so Sirwin, not next week, but the week after. Oh, this is gonna fail miserably. <laughs> all right, all right. So, real quick. To show that tar is viscoelastic. Because it's, they, they knew, but, but it's the kind of experiment where it's like, yes, it's viscoelastic, but it takes five years for a drop to form. So you have to have somebody who has the, the ability to invest that sort of ridiculous amount of time to say, look, I'm gonna prove it to you, like, a decade from now, <laughs> you're so gonna see like a drop. Very no, they have they have a viscosity for it, and that viscosity is like I don't know ten thousand or ten billion times the viscosity of water, for example. But so uh, next, not next week, but the week after, we'll probably have Serwin do the viscoelasticity <laughs> demo, so you'll be able to calculate some creep constants. Uh, that's the one we were going to do this week. If a typhoon hadn't hit Japan, <laughs> I know a butterfly flaps its wings. Uh, no, so next week we will be doing the tension lab as scheduled. So, tension lab. So, is that a formal write-up? Yes. Was the previous one informal? It was a lab write-up. Yeah. This one's so the la the last one you just had to do the analysis and the discussion. This one, you also need an intro, a procedure, uh, procedure conclusion, abstracts, uh, all of that kind of written out. So okay. it's supposed to be a more technical writing document. Yeah. How much of the lab manual will be able to reference or like reword? Uh, what do you expect from us as far as the kind of rewriting the lab manual? So we'll, yeah, for example, we'll, we'll give you a procedure and a setup, um, but you can take, so we'll, we'll give you a picture in the lab of the thing and of the samples. You can take a picture on your own or, or steal a picture from your friend who took one uh, of the actual experiment that you were doing. We'll want you to take pictures of the thing before and after testing. So there's there's four materials that we'll test, or two, three materials, I guess. 
a 6061 aluminum, uh, hot rolled A836 steel, and then carbon fiber composite, both in the fiber direction and orthogonal to the fiber direction, where you should see a pretty big anisotropy properties. And so the steel and the aluminum should neck and you get the either a cup cone fracture or a brittle fracture, and you'll see which is which. Um, and then the carbon fiber orthogonal should just kind of pop really lightly, and then the fiber direction should go bang. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so the trick with this lab is actually, so you'll have a couple uh, rectangular test tension test specimens for the metals and tabbed specimens for the composites. Uh, most of this lab, the intense part of this lab will be the data analysis. So we'll give you, you'll do four experiments in the lab and we'll give you another two for each lab. So eight, so 12 data sets total that you'll have to then, uh, I have an example. Uh, this isn't actually the data you'll see. This is from some of my research, but you'll have to figure out the Young's modulus, yield strength, max peak strength, uh, all of that from the experiments for each of those 12 data sets. So the intense part of the lab will be this sort of data analysis, which you can do in Excel, which you can do in MATLAB or Python. And next Monday, I'll talk through how you would go about it in MATLAB or Python. We'll try to give you a couple codes to get you started in MATLAB and Python. Um, so you're not starting at ground zero, but that'll be the time intensive part. You'll also have two weeks to do this lab instead of one. So, um, yes, tension specimens. There's the, the same uh, stress strain, true stress strain theory that you'd seen before, uh, a couple examples of brittle hardening, and then some composite theory, some carbon fiber composite equations you can use. Uh, and we'll give you material properties once we figure out exactly what they are. Questions? Are we gonna take like, multiple measurements at each like, data point so we can actually do like a standard deviation? So that's why we're giving you, so you'll do one test in lab and we'll give you two extra ones for and each experiment. And then you'll get standard deviation, average, okay. yeah. Because that's like kind of impossible with one measurement. Yeah. Okay. So that's why we're giving you the extra two, just because there's not time in lab to actually do it. All right. Cool. Uh, homework one is graded up here on the top. Uh, it's in alphabetical order. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't really understand. I don't